Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out and turn to the book of Hebrews. This is where we're going to start off this morning. A lot of scripture we're going to look at, but the book of Hebrews is where we're going to begin. Uh, it's good to be back. Becky and I and the boys were able to be out of town last week. We were up in Colorado uh, where the high never got above 68 degrees. Which, uh, which, which is a tough thing when you look at the forecast for San Antonio as you're driving home. It says that today it's going to be 127, which that, that's, it seems extra hot because you're coming from the mountains. Uh, but it's good, good to be back. Uh, how many of you are hunters? we have any hunters out there? Right, we're in Texas. It's, it's, it's okay to be a hunter. You go to people's houses. It's kind of interesting around here. You could go to multi-million dollar houses. You go inside and they have heads hanging on the wall. Everybody's a hunter, right? And so uh, I didn't grow up hunting, but probably in my, in my late 20s, I started hunting, got really into hunting, enjoy hunting a whole lot. And for the years that we lived in Louisiana and Tennessee, so about 10 years, uh, I didn't even shoot a gun. All I did was bow hunt. I don't know if you've ever been bow hunting before, but, but bow hunting is like, it's really hunting. Uh, in Louisiana and, and Tennessee, you can't hunt over food, you can't bait, so you're really out there in the woods, like trying to find animals and things like that. You might go the whole season and see a few deer and you couldn't even shoot at any of them. So to be a bow hunter, you want to be accurate. You want to be a good, a good shot. So I would practice a lot shooting my bow. Matter of fact, I was going to bring my bow this morning and set up one of the little cubes over here to show you how good a shot I am. And, and Don Lung, our executive pastor, talked to our insurance company, and they're like, don't think that's probably good. Somebody could die. Evidently, that's frowned upon. So uh, I didn't bring that, but, but let me just ask you a question. Knowing that, that I practice a lot shooting my bow, uh, I'm pretty good at, at shooting it, but from about 60 feet, I can hit a circle about like that. How many of you think, believe in me, that if I had brought my bow and set up the cube right over there, that from this distance especially, just like 20 yards, I could hit the bullseye? How many believe in me that I could do that? Right? Thank you. I appreciate that. I feel better about myself. Let, let's say, let's take it a step further. You believe in me that I could hit an arrow like this from 20 feet. How many of you would let me put an apple on your head and, and shoot it off? You, you no, nobody there. All right. It's amazing how you believe in me to shoot that little circle, but you don't believe me enough that you're willing to put your trust in me to shoot an apple off of your head. As, as we're kind of walking through this series, Where to Next, one of the interesting questions that someone asked was, what's the difference between believing in God and believing God? Believing in God and believing God. And so in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 6 is where I want us to look. And as he talks about faith, understanding that faith is believing God. He says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that when what is seen is not made out of things that are visible. By faith, belief. Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. Through faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he could not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. So, so faith is believing God. So when we talk about the difference between believing in God and believing God, it's amazing how taking one little word like I in, in out, makes such a huge difference, right? Believing in God could be just your general belief that there is a God out there. If you think about our culture today where we, we, we tend to kind of, you know, poo-poo on everything, that nobody believes in God anymore, and religions, you know, not accepted. And it, it's still about 85% of people in the United States that would say they believe in God. Now, that could be big G God. That could just be a God. They believe in God. So some people, when they say, I believe in God, it's that. I just kind of believe in this thing up there, you know, the big guy in the sky kind of thing. For some of us, if we say we believe in God, what we mean is we believe in God through Jesus for our salvation. That's like the first step. I believe in God and Jesus' his son for my salvation. That's where it begins. But unfortunately, what happens is that's where most of us stay. I believe in God. 
through faith for my salvation. But I never truly grow and sanctified, transformed to a place where I truly believe God, trust God. Let me give you an example uh, of what I'm talking about. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, you've heard me quote that verse. It's kind of a life verse, kind of a ministry verse. Our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask, think, or imagine. Right? That's a pretty blow-your-mind kind of verse, that God himself is saying, whatever you can think, whatever you can imagine, whatever your expectations are, I can blow those out of the water. Now, to say I believe in God is to say, well, that, that's a great verse. Believing God means that I really believe and live my life and pray as if I think and believe that that is true. That God is able to do exceedingly abundantly of all that I can ask, think, or imagine. That, that whether it's a marriage, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a financial situation, a job, whatever, that you think that there's no hope, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly in that situation. Above all that I could ask, think, or imagine. That's believing God. But so often we have trouble with that. Like even though it's right there, it's on the page, it says it, God's talking we have a hard time truly believing God, believing that this is true. Why do we struggle? I think we struggle for different reasons. I'll give you an example of why I struggle. In Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So, so as you read that verse, God's ways are higher, they're better. He knows everything from beginning to end. He has infinite wisdom. And honestly, I have a hard time wrapping my head around that. Like trusting God. Trusting God that, you know what, I'm not always going to understand the situation. I'm not going to always understand how you're working, but I'm just going to believe God for this. Because I'm kind of a control person and I want to figure things out, I have a hard time just letting go and having faith and believing God for what his word says and what his word promises us. So you, you can't put God in a box because he's uncontainable. We have to trust him. That's part of faith is trusting God that your ways are higher than my ways. That I'm not always going to understand this situation or how you're going to work, uh, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe God. It's moving beyond believing in God to actually believing God. Now, I want to get real practical as, it, as, it, as we talk about this. And, and here's the key to moving from believing in God to believing God. The key is taking him at his word. That's that trust area, that, that I actually take him at his word, that I actually believe what he says. Now, let me give you a great example of this. In the book of 1 Kings, and I'll read it for you in just a minute. 1 Kings, you have the prophet Elijah. In, in the Old Testament, a prophet of God spoke for God. So when they talked, it's as if God is talking to you. And God came to Elijah and he said, I want you to go to this certain place and I want you to wait. And there's a lady there and, and she's going to provide for you. Uh, she's going to feed you. So just go to this place. And Elijah, being smart, listen to God, went to where God commanded him to go. And he was just sitting there waiting. They're kind of on the outskirts of town. Context is basically kind of the slums of town, outside of town. He sees the lady. And he says, hey, could you get me a drink of water? So she turns to go get him a drink of water. And, and as she's going to get him a drink of water, he says, by the way, can you bring me a little cake? Bake, bake me a little piece of bread as well because I'm hungry. And she turns to him and she says, I have a little bit of oil and I have a little bit of flour. And the reason I'm here is I'm gathering sticks because this is all that we have. Basically, I'm going to make one last meal for myself and my son. And then we're probably going to starve to death and die. And you're asking me to give you some of this. He's like, that's exactly what I'm asking you to do. Go and make, bake for me a little cake and also for your son as well. And if you look in 1 Kings chapter 17, you don't have to turn here, but, but here's what happens. Elijah says to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. Now, let me just, again, kind of sum this up. This is a picture of God's provision. 
because she has this little bit of oil and this little bit of flour. This is all that she has. Like, we're going to eat this and we're going to die. And what does Elijah say, the word of the Lord? Go and bake some cake. Bring it to me first, and then you can have some for you and your son. Now, you want to talk about taking God at his word. That's trust. This is all I have left. The word of the Lord is I'm supposed to give some to this man that I don't even know. And he says that God's going to take care of all my needs. That's trusting God at his word. That, that's a real world example. I'm going to starve to death, but I'm going to trust that God is going to provide. Beth Moore in her Bible study, Believing God, stressed five things to remember when it comes to believing God. You might want to write these down. The first one is this. God is who he says he is. God is who he says he is. Now, we could spend all day just going through, here's a hundred different verses of all the different things that God says that he is, but let me just give you a few. John 14, 6, Jesus, who's God, talking, saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In Revelation, God's saying, I am the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, that God is love, that God is our strong tower, that God is our protector, that God is our wisdom. We can just spend all day going through everything in God's word that God says about himself. And if we're going to truly believe God, it starts with believing who God says that he is. But the second thing is we have to believe that God can do what he says that he can do. We just talked about that in Ephesians 3.20. Our God's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask, think, or imagine. How many of you think you have pretty good imaginations? Like, just think in your head, what, what would be the most amazing thing that God could do? And God goes, it's nothing. I can blow that out of the water. Do we believe God that way? That God could really restore this marriage that seems beyond restoration. He can do exceedingly abundantly. I can fix that. Do we believe, God, that he's truly going to provide when it seems like I don't have any resources, I've lost my job, I don't know what's going on, that God can provide? Do, do we believe that he can fix the relationship between me and my kids? Do we believe that that guy at work that you're like, he is so lost, there's no way that he could ever come to faith in Jesus Christ? He says, I can do exceedingly abundantly, but all that you could ask, think, or imagine. You know what the limitation is there? It's us. It's not God. God can do what he says that he can do. In Luke chapter 1, Gabriel is talking to Mary. If you remember back in the Christmas story. And I love this statement. Gabriel tells her, there's nothing that God cannot do. Can you imagine being a, a first-hand witness to, to God, that, that Gabriel stands in the presence of God for, for all of these years, and he says, listen, I've seen it. There's nothing that God cannot do. So if we're going to believe God, we have to understand that God can do what he says that he can do, that there's no limitations. And then we need to understand that I am who God says that I am. Now, this is hard because we want to start with all the good stuff. Because we live in this culture today where everybody gets a, a trophy, everybody gets a medal, everybody's patted on the back and told that they're wonderful and they're the best ever. And you are, you're wonderful people, you're the best ever. But here's the deal. When it comes to, to knowing who God says I am, we have to start at the beginning. In the beginning, in Ephesians chapter 1, it says that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. To come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we have to come to a place that we agree with God that I'm a sinner separated from God. I am who God says that I am. I, I'm a sinner separated from God. But he goes on to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, we were made alive together with Christ. By grace, we've been saved. So who am I? I'm a sinner separated from God. Even though I'm dead in my trespasses and sin through Christ Jesus, I'm made alive in Jesus Christ. By grace, I've been saved. And then he goes on in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. I, I was talking to some of our, our guys this morning. We were just sitting around for church, and I don't know how we got on this subject. We we're talking about fixing up cars. Uh, and I'm not a, I don't fix up cars. I don't even know how to change my oil, but I like cars. Uh, and I like cars that have been fixed up. 
And we were just talking about different things. One of our guys on staff got to go to the SEMA car show. I don't know if you know about that. It's, it's pretty amazing. They, they soup up all these cars. And, and if you know anything about car restoration, there, there's all different levels. You can like put a new paint job on all the way to what they call a frame off restoration, which basically they make an old car almost like a new car. It's the best version of an old car that it can be. And I think some of us, when we, when we hear that, that we're a new creation in Christ, we think we're, we're the best version of ourselves. Instead of believing God for what his word says, we're not the best version of our old self. We're actually a new creation. So when you think about your old life before Christ, the sins that so easily entangled us, that we were slaves to sin, that was my old self. It doesn't mean I still can't sin, but I've been set free from that. I'm not the best version of my old self. The Bible says that I'm a new creation. And if I'm going to believe God, that means I'm going to believe what his word says about me. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus by grace that I've been saved. And Ephesians 1.3 says that we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places through Christ Jesus. If you're going to believe what God says about you, do you think about your life and do you ever think, you know what, in Christ Jesus I'm blessed? Or are you always thinking about the things you don't have, the things you didn't get to do, or how you got slighted in this area and you don't think about how I'm blessed. Every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus as a child of God, I have. I am who God says I am. And then I can do all things through Christ. You heard that verse before? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, Tim Tebow got the patch under his eyes, praying, doing the kneeling thing. You know what we think when we hear that verse? Like, that's the magic genie ticket. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You know what I can't do? I can't dunk a basketball. Oh, but if you'll just claim that verse, yeah, I still can't dunk a basketball. Right? It, it's not a magic genie ticket. You know the context of that verse? I can do all things, Philippians 4.13. That means that every challenge that I have in life, I can face with faith, trusting him to help me overcome. That's what it means by I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means that marriage that's a train wreck right now, that there seems like there's no hope and I feel all alone. Listen, I can get through this because Christ strengthens me. The loss of your job, your finances, I can get through this. Through Christ who strengthens me. Facing this challenge with faith, God will help me overcome. I can do all things through Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the last thing he says there is that God's word needs to be alive and active in me. John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. Jesus is talking about the vine and the branch. And listen to what he says. He says that we need to abide in him. And he's going to abide in us. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus is talking about himself. I'm the brine, vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Right? God's word is alive and active in me. It bears fruit. Can I just share with you, and you've heard me say this, and I'm going to keep saying it. It's going to be like a broken record. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you will never grow to be the person that God desires for you to be apart from spending time in his word. Now, I realize we live in a culture where we want everything now. We want everything fast. Matt, I don't want to read all these verses. Give me like three, three steps to a happy life, something like that. No, no, no. The reality is we have to spend time in God's word and allow it to be active and alive in our lives. And we live in the greatest time in history as far as access to God's word. You have apps on your phone. You have devotionals on your phone. You got one-minute devotionals, three-minute devotionals, five-minute devotionals, 20-minute devotionals. You can go through a book. You can go through the whole Bible, whatever you want to do. It is all there. But we have to spend time in God's word and allow it to be active and alive in our life. Allowing God's word to take root inside of us and producing fruit. So, so let me give you a couple of practical things just to, to grasp onto as, as we look at this. Practical promises from God's word to believe. The first one, God will never leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5, that's what it says. God will never leave you or forsake you. Have you ever been abandoned? Have you ever felt 
alone. Maybe you think about your family. Maybe you think about one of your parents. They left. Maybe it was a spouse. Maybe it was a, a close friend. Maybe you're in a situation, a circumstance right now where you feel all alone. And if I'm going to believe God and believe his word, what does he say? I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Even when sometimes God feels distant, he hasn't left you. If I'm going to believe God, I have to believe that truth. God will never leave me. He'll never forsake me. The second one, I belong to God. Isaiah 43, 1, fear not. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. That pushes against that Texan and American ideal that I'm my own person, right? In the New Testament, it says that we were bought with a price. That, that we are God. So if we're going to believe God, we understand that I belong to God. Well, that impacts my life. That impacts my decisions. That impacts my direction because I'm not my own. I'm God's. I was bought with a price. If I'm going to believe God, I embrace that. I belong to God. He, he says that we are God's masterpiece created for a purpose. And just think about that. How, how many times when you were growing up did you have if maybe a, one of our girls... One of your parents tell you, you know what, you're pretty. You're beautiful. God created you in his image. This says that we're God's masterpiece. We're not just a $2 painting. We're his masterpiece created for a purpose. God created you for a purpose. You are where you are for a purpose. You are not in your job just because it's a job, God has you there for a purpose. You're not in your relationship with your spouse just to be in a relationship with your spouse. You're there for a purpose. You're not a parent of kids just to be a parent of kids. You are a parent for a purpose. God created in us a purpose. Before the foundation of the world, for whatever reason, God said, Matt Serber, you're going to be a preacher. I'm like, eh, I think you can do better than that, God. Well, but this is what I'm going to do. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are beyond your thoughts. You're going to be a preacher. Okay. I was created for a purpose, God's masterpiece. He says that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them in Ephesians 2.10. You were created for a purpose. You are God's masterpiece. If you're going to believe God, you embrace that truth for your life. And then the last one, nothing can separate you from the love of God. I love that. How many of you have messed up? I'm hoping every hand's up. If, if not, you just messed up. <laughs> we've all messed up. We, we've all fallen short. We've all sinned. How many times in our insecurities we think we've done something to alienate us from a friend or a spouse or, or any kind of relationship? Like we constantly live with that insecurity. But what does it say? Nothing can separate you from the love of God. That sin that so easily entangles, that it seems like you're always doing battle with this one thing, whether it's gossip, whether it's lying, whether it's cheating, pornography, an addiction, whatever, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Romans 8 talks about this, and I, I love the way that, that Paul writes this in verses 38 and 39. He says, for I'm sure... That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Maybe when you were growing up, you didn't feel loved. Maybe you feel like you've done something to somebody else and, and now they don't love you anymore. You never have to worry about that when it comes to God. He will never leave you, forsake you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. If I'm going to believe God, I, I've grown to a place where I trust that this is true. Moving from believing in God to believing God. When I was a kid, we would go on family trips. And this was back in the day when, like, kids in the back seat didn't wear seat belts. I know that that's foreign. Like, all of our young kids are like, what? Yeah, we didn't wear seatbelts. We had station wagons. We would make like pallets in the back. We'd lay all over, lay on top of each other. You'd lay in the floorboard. If you were a little kid, you'd lay up in the back windshield, like just right up there, feet sticking out of the car. Nobody cared. 
we all survived, at least most of us. And anytime we went on a trip when I was a little kid, I could just go to sleep, you know, whatever, because I had complete trust and confidence in my dad that was driving the car. I don't know what that was. It's just like, you know what, if my dad's driving the car, I'm not worried about anything. I'm not concerned about anything. Just complete trust and confidence. And because I believed him, I had peace. The same thing's true for us. We have a heavenly father. We just talked about the fact. He loves you. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. He wants you to believe him to trust him, to have faith in him and confidence in him. And you know what happens when we grow and as we grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ, when I believe God, when I grow to that point when I can start believing all of these things are true in my life and living my, my life like these things are true, you know what I have? Peace. Because I know that my daddy is driving the car. It's moving from Believing in God to believe in God. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you that, that you want us to grow in our relationship with you. God, I thank you that you gave us your word and the truth of your word, the promises of your word, that, that we can believe those things to be true. And God, as we grow in our relationship with Christ, as we believe those things to be true, God, you, you transform our hearts. And God, we can, we can live at peace knowing that our daddy is in control. Lord, I pray today for anyone that doesn't know Jesus. They, they need to go back and take that first step, believing in God, believing in Jesus Christ, your son, who died for them so that they could have life. So God, I pray if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus, Father, that today might be the day of salvation, that they might believe in you. But, Father, for many of us here, we, we know that we're saved. We know we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. God, help us to grow, to trust you, to have faith in the things that you say in your word, that those things are true, that we apply them and live our lives as if these things are, are true to us, that we truly believe God. God, help us to be a church full of individuals who believe God and the truth of your word and the promises of your word. God, help us to have that confidence that our daddy, God, our heavenly father, is driving the bus and he's in control. And God, through that, we gain peace. So, Father, thank you for that. Thank you that you call us to that. Thank you that you desire that from us, to just trust God, believe God. Father, that's my prayer for us today. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today for our online worship service. God is doing so many things at Mission City Church that we would love for you to be a part of. Just go to missioncity.church to learn more. I also want to encourage you to worship today through giving. Click the Give button at the top of your screen and you can be a part of our mission in that way as we continue to see God transform lives here in San Antonio and online. We'll see you next week.